Eh, buenos días a todos los presentes. Eh, antes de hacer la presentación, decir que se puede seguir eh, en traducción inglesa eh, lo que el doctor Jack Morellón nos dirá. En todo caso, eh, posteriormente, cuando se coloque... Uh, speech, when it's... Uh... On the web, it will be both in Spanish and English. Jacques Morillon was born in Vevey in uh, Switzerland in 1939. He has a degree in law uh, from Lausanne University and has a PhD in political sciences from the Institute of High International Studies of Geneva. All his uh, professional career, uh, most of it uh, has uh, been in the International Red Cross Committee, and he's also been the Secretary General of the World Scout uh, Organization. Uh, he succeeded Jacques Fremont as uh, uh, head of uh, international negotiations uh, for 15 uh, uh, years at the uh, uh, International Center of Applied Studies in Negotiation, Casin in Geneva. I won't extend myself much further because we're here to listen to Jacques Morion, and it's uh, fantastic to have him here at uh, the Foro Cordoba's initiative and Paradigma Cordoba. I leave you with Dr. Morion. Thank you, uh, Director. I will start my lecture in English, and then I will be speaking Spanish. And the first thing that needs to be said in English. Do not forget to put back your handphones after the conference is over, assuming that you have already taken them off. Thank you very much. This is also what you do in church nowadays. It's a great pleasure and indeed an honor for me to be here in Casa Arabe, uh, of which I have heard a lot through my friend uh, Moratinos in particular, and uh, which represents a good continuation of the relationship between Spain and the Arab world, despite changes in uh, those in power. And I think it's very important that a country like Spain does not uh, change its directions in its relationships to the Arab world uh, when it changes uh, from conservative to labor government and vice versa. I consider that Casa Arabe is the manifestation of uh, the continuity of the relationship, the special relationship between Spain and the Arab world. And for this, it is for me uh, the right place to be today. I shall speak to you in my quality as uh, International Vice President of Foundation Paradigma Cordova in Cordoba, as its name indicates. And the subject of my talk will be the Foro de Cordoba as a concept, more perhaps than as a project, which I personally consider and we consider as very promising in terms of convivence. I shall come back to that word of convivence later. Certain names carry their own universal image, each for historical reasons of its own. If I say Alcazar or Robben Island, you immediately think prison. If I say Davos, you immediately think World Economic Forum, except perhaps the oldest one like me, who still think of Davos as a place where you ski or can't afford to ski. If I say Cordova, you think tolerance or coexistence 
or a similar word. And this is part of what we could call universal consciousness, or even perhaps universal subconscious, because these names may evoke their specific image even for people who do not necessarily and exactly know why, for lack of more precise historical knowledge. If I say so, it's because the Cordoba Forum is born out of two such names and indeed personal experiences. One is Robben Island and the other one is Davos. In the years 72 to 75, I had the privilege of being Delegate General for Africa for the International Committee of the Red Cross. And part of my job was to visit Robben Island and, of course, amongst other prisoners, Nelson Mandela, Walter Sisulu, Thabo Mbeki, and many others, uh, so, sorry, Gowan Mbeki, Thabo was the president, Gowan was his father, and many others who were uh, in prison and had been for a while and were to stay for a while on Robben Island. I visited Mandela six times, and six times I spoke with him at length and without witness because the visits of the International Committee of the Red Cross are visits that are paid without witness so that one can speak at ease with each prisoner. I did keep contact with Mandela later. We met eight more times before he was present, when he was present, after he was present. But I have kept two things personally from my six visits to him. And these two things are linked to two things. One is intolerance, and the other one is hate. There was a prisoner named Neville Alexander on Robben Island. He was a doctor in German philology, a very well-educated man. And he was cold, and he asked for more blankets. And the Boer prison warder who was taking care of him, 20 years old perhaps, asked him, where did you get blankets when you were in the bush? Here is a half-educated white prison warder asking a PhD, a doctor in philology, where he got blankets when he was in the butch. When I told that anecdote to Mandela during my visits, he said, well, Jack, don't forget, ignorance is the mother of intolerance. And he added with a half smile, which is why I use my prison years to learn Afrikaans. I have to get to know my adversaries. So that's one first thing I learned through Mandela. Ignorance is the mother of intolerance. The second thing I learned came towards my last visit. I had been, I had visited him six times and I was going to another job as Director of Principles and Law at the, at the ICRC. Uh, and we had a very friendly conversation, I would say. And there was one problem with the censorship of his mail, because his letters were censored in such a nasty way, I would say, 
that it gave double meanings, particularly the letters from his wife. Uh, the censorer would bore out parts of sentences, and what was left from these letters, you could not know if it was a love letter or if she was telling him that he had a lover outside. And I said, Nelson, I must tell you, if I were you, I think I'd hate the man, which was not a very Red Cross remark and does not stand in my official reports, which will be published in 2015 because the archives of the ICRC opened in 2015, but I just said it on my heart. And he said, Jacques, never forget, hate only harms him who hates, not the hated. Hate only harms him who hates, not the hated. This was the second major lesson, not only which I learned, but which he taught to all his people. Because if it had not been for Mandela and for his vision of non-hate of the adversary, South Africa would never be what it is today. Now, I come to the second thing which brought me to the concept of the Cordoba uh, Forum. In my earlier years, I was quite linked with the launching of what has become today uh, the World Economic Forum in, Devo, in Davos. Not so much with Professor Schwab as with another man named Havrelishin, who is a, a Ukrainian, a very great thinker and economist. And I have been thinking, why is Devo, Davos such a success? that you go to any of your country, you say Davos, people think World Economic Forum. Why? For a very simple reason. People, the same people, the same people, not necessarily the same person, but the same kind of people, meet every year regularly in the same place to talk of the same subject. It is the repetition of the people, the subject, and the place that makes it. If you think of that great idea which was born uh, here, the dialogue of civilization, I, I don't want to sound critical, but if you say dialogue of civilization, what does it mean to people in general? Why? There's a lot of money invested in it. But it takes place once in Madrid, the next time in Ankara, the third time in New York, and, and, and the people change. Uh, just the theme stays the same. But it's like water in the hands. It doesn't concentrate, unlike the water which produces electricity when it is in a pipe. And I thought, because I was in Paradigma Cordoba, I thought, why could we not do the same? Why could we not do the same with Cordoba? Because even to the uneducated, Cordoba is to a certain extent a symbol of Coexistence. They may not know about Al-Andalus. They may not know if it's a myth or if it was true. But to an averagely educated person, you say Cordoba, and they think of the mosque, and they think of coexistence between the three great religions. So Davos did not have that before. No, it was a skiing resort. Cordoba already has this capital. It's there, it's in the history, it's in the, AD, in the DNA of, of the city. Why not capitalize on it by bringing excuse me, together every year the same people to talk about the same subject? 
this <coughs> is in summary <coughs> the concept of the Cordova Forum and how, together with my colleagues at Paradigma Cordova Forum, we got to it. I shall now switch to Spanish. Y primero tengo que hablarles un poquito de la Fundación Paradigma Cordova y de la noción de Paradigma. Of the uh, Fundación Paradigma Cordova. Then I will talk a bit about vocabulary and especially about the word convivencia, convivence. I'll speak about the participants who we're thinking of when we speak about the Foro de Córdoba, and I will finish with the program and the concept of the uh, Fundación Paradigma Córdoba. El Paradigma and the paradigm of Cordoba itself. The foundation was founded in 1987. It was founded by Rojo Garidi. Now, the name was uh, given to it uh, until 2010. The, the bylaws, the statutes, set out the essential goals of the foundation, which uh, is included in the text that you have been given, which is to uh, remember the role of the capital of Cordoba back in the 13th century in the reciprocal promotion of the, uh, the Eastern cultures and also the Western and Judeo-Christian culture and the um, symbiosis in Al Andalus of the three Abrahamic uh, Judea, Jude, Jewish, Christian and Muslim religions fostering the exceptional cultural dimension of the city of Cordoba under the principles and founding values of uh, universality, euchemism, and dialogue. That is the basic article underpinning the founding of the Paradigm Foundation. Our foundation is convinced that our societies should highlight the messages of concord as a deep felt urgent message for us to have individual and collective responsibility and that is why we have changed our traditional or, or usual cultural activities. What we've done is launch two major projects that will help to um, foster convivence and uh, intercultural values. Essentially, we have the Cordoba Forum, I've already mentioned that today, and then something else which is called the Roads of Concord. I'm sure you're very familiar already with that activity. We're proposing that Cordoba, in time, in time, should be acknowledged as the world's capital of confidence. You would see that, Cordoba, cap world's capital of confidence. Our foundation, focuses on very clear references uh, which really have a lot to do with what the two words actually mean, paradigm and Cordoba. And when the two go together, those two words placed together have a potential symbolic universal meaning that they do not have separately. The, the luminous and constant reference to the paradigm of Cordoba, which would like to promote a more tolerant world, a world that is more open to the values of others, versus ignorance, more respectable or respectful of diversity. Concord, Concord is one of the key words here. The concord between different people, different human beings, on the basis of two values, we have what had happened historically, and it's a symbolic interpretation because it, there is also something of the myth about Cordoba. The good myths that humankind 
is endowed with represent a commitment between reality and symbol because reality experiences a symbolic interpretation and with dimensions that really take on a life of their own. They take on a life of their own and they manage to, to promote those historic contents and setting themselves out as an exemplary and highly effective way of reflecting those moral values. That happened with the concept of paradigm of Cordoba. Some of the essential meanings have a lot to do with the Iranian philosopher Ramin Jahan Bega, who says, and uh, your interpreter notes that uh, the speaker is reading a text that we do not have. He said, Europe needs Cordoba because it needs to be able to have a dialogue with itself and the whole world outside, and there could be no dialogue about culture without the culture of dialogue. That is uh, what he wrote. It's funny then when we were defending Cordoba as the potential capital of uh, culture. It was a well thought out idea. Other contributions to the same concept include Juan Jose Tamayo, who I'm sure you have heard of. About Jahan Beglu, and he said this, and uh, Juan Jose Tamayo is talking about this. Once again, this is a quote from his text that he considered the Al Andalusi experience crucial for today's world for three reasons. Number one, the level of civilization that was reached in Al-Andalus. Cordoba was then the most advanced city in the continent when in the rest of Europe. There, there was a certain amount of twilight there, but uh, Islam took the city to the highest possible heights uh, of uh, knowledge uh, known in the world, mathematics, astronomy, music, archaeology, poetry, etc. were all taken to those heights. Two, and Andalus was a repository of the know-how and science of ancient Greece. And it was also a track to be able to transfer that knowledge to the West, which was under the influence and the, the domination of Christiani Christianity. We could also talk about the School of Translators, the Setup in Toledo then. Three, the third reason. Currently, the Al-Andalusi culture is recognized and appreciated and valued by because of its religious plurality and its high degree of t tolerance. The two key philosophers of the times in Al-Andalus, uh, with their work and with their, their life, showed us uh, that uh, we need to be guided as human beings uh, by the fight against fanaticism. Before making the presentation of the forum itself to you, I'd like to share with you some thoughts that we have had ourselves in our discussions in the board at the foundation about the vocabulary that we are using for this project. Words have weight. Words are very important. Let me take a very current example for you. If, if you ask why we talk about the Daesh and we don't use other words, to wonder what is going on in Iraq and Iraq, Iran, then the answer is there is a certain weight to words. And we have to think about how we can bring words into modern conversation and modern thoughts and introduce them. I think one of the purposes then of this initiative was to choose words which would really reflect faithfully the historic reality of Andalus. It would be a way of actually keeping the flame burning and uh, not just um, allowing the ashes to lie there. 
There are, there are certainly some positive contemporary meanings that are full of, full of hope that we could actually attach to these words. That is why we've, had a, we've thought in four languages, Spanish, French, English, and Arabic. And what we've done with those four languages is search for words that sound the same way in all of the languages. In other words, tolerance, coexistence, interculturality, dialogue, and concord. But tolerance seemed to us to be a word that, that, that was slightly negative in connotations. You tolerate somebody, you put up with something or somebody, don't you? And even though that, that that word might really be the right one if you're thinking about those times, the times of Al-Andalusia, uh, you tolerated then um, this people's smells and you used to look at them up and down and decide whether to tolerate them or not. Maybe that wasn't quite right. Coexistent. You, you obviously have a knee-jerk reaction to think about the idea of peaceful coexistence uh, in uh, the post-Cold War years. And even though, and if we don't add peaceful as an adjective, it seems a little bland as a word, a, a little neutral, then an interculturality. It's too intellectual sounding, isn't it? Now, as for dialogue, that term universal might make more sense, but it doesn't actually set out an objective. We also have to think about that. Dialogue is a means to achieving an end, to reaching a goal. So in itself, dialogue as a word is not a purpose or a goal and doesn't work. Concord is a term that sounds exactly the same in the three languages. That's an advantage, isn't it, if you're thinking in other languages and speaking in other languages. But, but whereas it works in Spanish, we felt that concord in French and concord in English were words that didn't necessarily uh, lead us to think of exactly the same ideas, and so their use was rather inartificial. So we, we designed to use entente instead of concorde in French. But it still seemed a little weak as a word, and we felt that we had to, had to add an adjective, just as we would adding peaceful to coexistence. So perhaps in French it would have to be the entente cordiale, uh, such as the entente cordiale that exists between uh, UK and France, uh, obviously, whenever you say Entente Cordiale, you think about that, uh, the relationship between France uh, and Great Britain. And so we came up with the word convivencia in Spanish. Since, since 2004, it has been a word accepted by the French Academy, uh, convivence, uh, so only for the last 10 years, uh, it's spelt with an A in, in French, uh, even though it sounds better in Spanish, convivencia, and it has been used in English in the Spanish version, funnily enough, uh, since the 1990s. But we've, we also use convivence uh, in uh, English, spelt with an E, C-O-N-V-I-V-E-N-C-E, -E, instead of the A that it has in the French spelling. Therefore, if, if we decide that Cordoba should become a capital of the world, maybe it should be the world's convivence capital, and we could use either the term spelt in French or in English. Nevertheless, we're open to other formula, such as subtitles, Cordoba Forum, have a dialogue uh, to live together or models of convivence. The important thing is to regularly use this word and associate it with Cordoba and have those subtitles that also, that also include dialogue, uh, convivence, dialogue as a method, of course. If we constantly are using those words, we would hope that we would in, in um, our subconscious uh, get the the idea that Cordoba equals is the world's capital of confidence. And little by little, the event would really 
take on a weight. These, of course, uh, are not engraved in stone as ideas and words. We have to think about how to progress. But the real success of the project will not just depend on the practical aspects, such as funding, but also on the choice of the name. The, the annual repetition of the event and, of course, the choice and selection of the participants. And that is why I'd like to actually present to you the concept of the forum itself. But I would also like to read out part of that letter of invitation to the people we would like to join us at the event, because that extract gives you the idea of how we're presenting the concept in just a few short words. First of all, we would invite the people, individuals and institutions. As such, they would be institutions and personalities that the common denominator the would be that they would help us to contribute to greater tolerance, greater confidence between diverse communities. When we wonder who we should invite, you, you may think, well, why have we use this long definition? The minimum, the minimum common denominator is to the common denominator is to, for each one of them to be contributing to a world with greater confidence, more tolerance amongst different communities. We say it's not just about participating in an international event, a major international event, but it's about making an active contribution to the implementation of a long-lasting project, the setting up, the launch of a project that will last, the annual meeting to be held in Cordoba of uh, the individuals and institutions that advocate more universal confidence. The, the main individual or institutional champions of that universal tolerance, founded on the mythical reality of those times. A myth isn't a reality, is it? And reality isn't mythical. So that is why the two go together. The mythical reality of that uh, period of mutual tolerance, which was Al Andalus in Cordoba. And with regard to, to this meeting of um, known and acknowledged agents uh, that have really been appreciated because of work they're doing, the Cordoba forum has an objective, a goal, and this is where we talk about that goal, which will be to create, set up an informal network. It's networking. This is so important. We're not going to be setting up an organization. This is not going to be the UN Mark II at all. No, it's going to be a network, an informal network that we'll be setting up of interpersonal relationships. We are not talking here about interinstitutional relationship at all. We've got the UN to do that. There are other organizations that do that. What we have to do is build up those interpersonal relationships and with time. And once we hold this event regularly, and let me just stress that again, this is not a one-line stand. We're not just holding this as a one-off event. No, it's not going to be like that. Over time, and as we repeat this event, we will be able to create what we call a critical mass. We have to build up this critical mass that can actually prompt movement 
And that critical mass should be able to have a long-lasting impact on the way we think. We will be working in this international network to be able to have an impact at a local level. That is also extremely important. So we have an international critical mass which will achieve something on a local level. If you wouldn't mind, I'd like to repeat those words because they are just a few short words, but they really do sum up for you the purpose to create a, a long-lasting network of interpersonal relationships. And with that repetition, regular repetition of the event, we should be able to have a uh, lasting impact on mentalities. We'll be working in an international web network to have an impact at a local level. So who's going to be invited? Well, well, whoever is invited, they will be co-founders. That is the idea of the very first event. We're not set inviting people to join an event that already exists. We're inviting people to a foundational event. Uh, they can be co-founders. You have to invest in this yourselves. It's not our project. It's your project. It's the project that belongs to the people who will be coming to the event. That is also extremely important. People who come to it will be the co-founders of the project uh, as they participate in that very first Cordoba Forum. Who will the participants be? That was actually a real problem because uh, with uh, the Asemi Foundation, which is another one I belong to, which has uh, earmarked a sum of money to be able to help launch the project, it's also got uh, an award uh, it, uh, for tolerance, it, which it grants. The very first one was given to Nelson Mandela in 2004. We took it to him and, and gave it to him personally. The second award was granted to the city of Fez because of its famous festival. We were quite struck by this. I, I know this is this is not to do with the, the main subject of the conference, but let me tell you, we were, we were struck by how many wars had taken place there because of religions, and then this organization of a, of a sacred music festival seemed fantastic to me because it is quite the opposite, isn't it? It's of religious wars. You're bringing people together under the ages of uh, their religious feeling, but joined by music. Perhaps music is the most universal value we have in the world today. So the second award for tolerance uh, was given to Fez for their music festival. And the third one, I I don't know whether there's anybody from Algeria here, but but we gave posthumously the war to Abel Kader, not only because of uh, his resistance uh, to French imperialism, but he was a great historian and a poet, and he himself invented humanitarian law 20 years before it was invented by uh, Henri Dupont. He was a man who was a man before his time in humanitarian terms and in 1860 as a Muslim, he saved maybe 10,000, even 20,000 Christians in Damascus. They were about to be killed by the Druze who, who had uh, prepared to massacre them all. That was 1860 in, in Damascus, and that wasn't even his country. But it seemed that Abdel Kader was a worthy winner of that uh, award. And the fourth one was, was given 
to a Swiss international organization which has done so much for international dialogue for so long, with quite a lot of influence of the Quakers too. So the Usemi Foundation have been doing that. And what we've also done is draw up a list of those institutions which, one way or another, make a contribution to a more tolerant world. We've uh, listed up to 260. Of course, we had to choose a, a fixed number of institutions and people to invite to the Cordoba Forum. And we, ha we worked together with uh, the Swiss Embassy here in Madrid. They were, gave us some very useful help. And we brought down that figure to 100. I, I know uh, that uh, that cutoff uh, number was always going to be artificial, but we had to come up with a short list. And in the documentation you'll be given, you will see that in that list, uh, there's a real mixed bag of institutions, some very important ones, such UNICEF, uh, UNESCO, uh, such uh, as uh, the ICCR, there's the Carter Center, and of course, Casa Arabi is on that list, uh, the, and uh, the other institutions like uh, Casa Arabi here, the Arab League, uh, Educational and Scientific uh, Organization. I'm not going to read through the whole list, but that list uh, is still open. If there is anybody who would like to join us in the project, uh, then there's an, there's an open list there that you can put your name down. But at least we had to come up with an initial idea on who to invite. Let me finish with the document, which uh, I hope you won't read right now, but you'll be able to find as part of your dossier, and that is the introduction to the first Cordoba Forum. So the first question is for whom and why, and he we say that uh, the that the most widespread problem facing us today is the lack of tolerance at all levels. That is almost the universal evil that we're all facing, and that is a lack of tolerance at all different levels. Confronted with its disputes, its differences, and its injustices, our world has the greatest need for what we call a minimum common ideal. An ideal that allows us to live together. And that ideal is convivence. Who is the invitation for? Well, the common denominator of the recipients of this invitation is the fact that they are all each in its own way and field, and that is so important. The common denominator is very broad. We're not going to change the way institutions, UNESCO or other institutions work. Each one can continue to do its work in its own way as it wishes. So each in its own way and field are striving for a more tolerant world, a world with greater convivence. This invitation is for all of those institutions and individuals who want to create over time and on a global scale, not one single organization, not an organization, but rather a network and especially a spirit of Cordoba. That is another expression that we have uh, to really become attached to. I remember there was uh, in the past uh, the Esprit de Genève uh, 20 years ago, uh, trying to actually uh, lower the tension in the world uh, after the Cold War. So we're thinking about this spirit of Cordoba now, that it could be something to bring us forward in a federation of consciences, 
in the acceptance of others and of their differences. That's all. That's it. That's what it's all about. It just means accepting other people and their differences. That is the common denominator of the 100 institutions and individuals on this list. Our project consists of establishing a yearly meeting in the historic city of Cordoba, bringing together all the international institutions and personalities who aim, among other things, to promote a world of confidence which is that ability of human beings, and we've tried to define here the, the word convivence as the ability of human beings and their communities to live together, or, or that they should have, in as much harmony as possible, respecting their differences. We've done quite a lot of work uh, in the Swiss Embassy to, to come up with a definition, something that would actually make sense. Uh, this is not a dictionary definition. But we're saying confidence is the ability that we have to live together in as much harmony as possible. We don't actually say to live together in harmony. We see in as much harmony as possible and add respecting differences. The, the Andalus period, well, the city of Cordoba owes to the Andalus period it's renowned for a role model for living together, even though the tolerance of Al-Andalus was a limited reality that has become a myth. And that is why we also talk about reality and myth, or myth and reality. How, to, how can we help to promote a universal contemporary reality on the basis of that myth and reality? A realistic utopia is another term that we have thought of, of course, that is a contradiction in itself, isn't it? A realistic utopia. Utopia cannot be realistic, but we need to have that word utopia. How can we provide universal content to this beautiful word, convivencia in Spanish, convivance in, in French, uh, conv convivence? Uh, in English uh, and Ayush in Arabic, uh, forgive my pronunciation, goes above and beyond the notions of tolerance, coexistence, harmony, understanding, acceptance or comprehension. It's the perfect expression of the ideal and spirit to which the name of Cordoba is associated. Indeed, the city itself it aspires to become a world symbol of this concept. An event designed to be held every year. By taking place every year, this event, the Cordoba Forum, should become a place for intercultural dialogue, unavoidable intercultural dialogue. T today, people pay a lot of money to go to Davos, the very first Davos meetings, you know. Uh, were meetings that had to pay people to go to. Of course, we're talking about uh, economy as a subject matter, not about convivence, but today, it's all on the basis of invitation. Not just anybody can go to Davos, and everybody wants to go to Davos. What I would like is uh, once we've held the 10th annual event in Cordoba, that everybody will want to come to Cordoba because it's absolutely inevitable, it's unavoidable. It is the place to go and to be. It is a privileged meeting point to be penciled into the agenda of all of those who work for this common ideal of achieving a more universal convivence. What about the objectives? What will they be? We have summarized them, but uh, there is a better detailed breakdown of them in the document. The general permanent objectives will be as follows. The, 
identify the obstacles and analyze the conflicts that the promotion of convivence faces. We believe that it is highly and a highly interesting idea to think about putting on the same panel session someone from the ICRC with somebody maybe from UNESCO and somebody from the Carter Center maybe and also some representative of a small Asian in institution um, looking into issues of intolerance in India or between India and Pakistan. You could think about those possibilities. The objective then is to identify the obstacles and analyze the conflicts that the promotion of confidence faces. Personally, for instance, if I'm asked to identify those obstacles as the uh, former head uh, of an education-based uh, institution, the scout movement, I would say, a lack of education, a lack of uh, ignorance. Remember, as Mandela himself said, ignorance is the mother of intolerance. We have to think about schools first and foremost, but that would be my own personal answer to the question. It would be very interesting to hear what everybody else has to say to, des to describe the means, how those obsta obstacles can be overcome, because uh, the ICRC doesn't use the same uh, means uh, as Amnesty International or other institutions such as UNICEF and UNESCO also trying to achieve greater tolerance. Each institution uses its own means to be able to reach the same goal. Another objective would be to share experiences and thus be inspired by the success of others. That, if that has worked for you, why doesn't it work for us? And coordinate, well, coordinate is quite a weak word, isn't it? Coordinate our respective efforts to contribute in a more concrete way to a world of more universal convivence through those concrete actions and thanks to the critical mass generated. That is the idea of this coordination based on interpersonal relationships, uh, people who trust each other, not, not just uh, a formal, official link, uh, people wearing their suits and ties and, and between institutions. It's very important for the very first forum to be a foundational summit so that the people who go there get the feeling that they are in it at the beginning, that they are part of something that is starting up, that they are founding something that will go on and on. I mean, I won't be uh, around maybe when things get to that point, but that isn't the most important thing, is it? Think about those people who have founded the Red, the Red Cross and humanitarian law. There were just five people from Geneva. I wonder whether they actually had an idea of how far that initiative would go to. I, I'm not sure, but we need to have the feeling that we are part of something that could change the world today. It's all about the psychology defining that very first Cordoba Forum. So the first one would be a foundational summit, and it has to be very open. It must also take on the responsibility of paving the way for the following events. And really, what the first foundation summit will do will be to um, prepare the second and following ones. Uh, I have plenty more that I could say, but I am trying not to go beyond the time allotted to me. You can see in the documentations you've been given, there's also the idea of uh, a road to Concord, which uh, grew out of an experience that we had in Cordoba 
which was a road from Santiago de Compostela to Cordoba, which is, uh, of course, a revolutionary idea. If you think about those people who go to Compostela, if it, you're asking them really to turn their backs on Santiago de Compostela as they go south to Cordoba as a symbol of tolerance here. It's, it's a, a wonderful idea. You'll also find the program for the project, uh, and uh, we, you can see that the list of people, Manuel Torres, uh, Juan Jose Tamayo, all of those people are on the list uh, or as possible speakers. You can read uh, that yourself because this isn't a final program. It's just being drawn up so you get some idea of what this is all about. So lastly, this is like a turnkey project. The only thing that we need now is an entity, an institution, and I'm saying one. I'm not looking for half a dozen different institutions that have to really uh, discuss and argue and how much they're going to put in there. We, we have to find one just one that understands the extraordinary potential of this idea, that understands that it could even be a government putting in just a very small amount of money. We're talking about a budget here of 700,000 for the very first one, 700,000 euros. And that isn't very much money at all, is it, for some institutions? But they have to be prepared to invest that during at least three years as the launch phase for the, pro for the project. We can't have someone saying, well, I'll pay for the first one, but not, no more after that, no. I think everyone that here has to understand this is not a one-night stand, it's not a one-off event. The success will be all about the repetition of the event. Uh, it will be always held in Cordoba and the same people will come. You have to understand that a, a very, very simple, straightforward idea can really make a difference in today's world. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Dr. Morillon. Antes de pasar a turno de Thank you, Dr. Morillon. Eh, Before we go María to the question turn, I'd like to give the floor to Maria Jesús Viguera. Thank you. Pues previendo foreseeing, as uh, has in fact been the case, uh, that uh, Jacques Morillon was going to present uh, uh, the project of uh, the Foro de Córdoba as brilliantly as he has, uh, I will mention four elements uh, that uh, need to be said. I would like to express my appreciation, my recognition, underscore the importance of uh, uh, coexistence, of convivence, and my own involvement. First, I'd like to express my appreciation to Casa Arabe and Accent Tribune and everything relative to our uh, culture. Culture, in the broadest possible sense of the word, uh, in the past, its present, and future. I also want to thank everyone for their very interesting attendance. And uh, secondly, I'd like to express my recognition to Dr. Jacques Morillon, uh, who came up with the idea of this idea of the Forum of Cordoba that he has designed based on his experience as a uh, uh, senior uh, international uh, official, and also to the Fundación Paradigma Cordoba, represented by its two vice presidents, Jean Marie and Mar Margarita Luis Ruiz Schrader. And uh, by myself, uh, uh, as I uh, 
am a member of the Fundación Paradigma Córdoba. My third comment has to do with underscoring the need of speaking about uh, concord and convivence and to act accordingly uh, in accordance with this idea and uh, what this word means. If uh, living coexisting with its dimensions, both moral and uh, theoretical and practical, and uh, living in societies and people's world, I'm sure that uh, our lives and the lives of the world will be better. And this idea be became more extensive in the creation of lexicon of uh, words that uh, uh, that become more precise. Atayus uh, came up in Arabic uh, and relatively recently in English and uh, that is uh, coming up in other languages of the world because today the world the word of reference is precisely convivence updating what it means is uh, is expressed uh, well by this uh, term finally fourthly i'd like to say something on my own personal involvement in what i think uh, and i'm speaking as a member of academia that um, we, the academics, uh, should uh, bring together both our studies, uh, which are often very isolated in our, let's call them, uh, towers of paper, uh, with uh, human and social commitments. This is a splendid field of commitment and action, and we would like to express our favor. We Arabists uh, have good examples of this. I'd only like to refer to a top figure, uh, paying pay tribute to the great uh, uh, expert in Islam, Luis Massignon, who called it compassion in its mm, purest etymological meaning with pathos or without pathos, the Greek reference, but which he does in the 20th century. And it made sense for him to use this word. Uh, Louis uh, Massillon knew how to uh, combine his uh, expertise as an Arabist, as an Islamologist, uh, as w together with an interest for coexistence with convivence. Every year, uh, he went to Jerusalem on uh, as a pilgrim, as the uh, main and supreme example of convivence. And we're very close to what to comparing this pilgrimage to Cordoba for convivence without avoiding other places of convivence because convivence is universal. This meaning, convivence, which can be expressed with this co complementary synonymity as well, is very important because at present, the Fundación Paradigma de Córdoba is very involved and is coming up with this Foro de Córdoba, which is one of our most important proposals. And thank you very much for allowing us to speak here. Thank you for coming. And I trust that we may all continue working on this project, which I consider to be most necessary. Thank you.